Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to say welcome to a Tip Post YouTube channel. Secondly, today's presentation will be Introduction to Communicable Disease Prevention and Control for BSc Nurse Students. So, before I directly proceed to the today's session, would you please subscribe, like, comment, and share a tip post? I thank you. Your host. <coughs> so, uh, let us get started. So, today, our focus of discussion will be on communicabilities prevention and control, or CDC for BSc nursing uh, students. So that after watching this video, if you have any comments or any questions or concerns, you can contact through the address provided here. Thank you. So under chapter one, uh, we have learning uh, objectives. So by the end of this chapter, learners will be able to identify definitions of common terms used in communicabilities and control, describe the factors involved in the chain of communicabilities transmission, third, describe the stages in the natural history of communicabilities, Fourth, describe the general principles of prevention and control of communicabilities. So these are the four uh, learning outcomes. So, <clears throat> so for better understanding, it is very good to answer this question first. So. Question number one, what is communicabilities? So, a communicable disease is an infectious disease that can be transmitted from one individual to another, either directly by contact or indirectly by vomitus and vectors. Or, it can also be defined as illness caused by microorganisms and transmitted from an infected person or animal to another person or animal. So once you have defined what communicability is, then the next question will be, can you list some of the common communicabilities in your setup. So, based on that, uh, as you can see, here we have the categories of communicabilities and lists under each. So, for example, we have food or waterborne diseases. For example, we have diarrheal disease, basilary, dysentery, cholera, typhoid fever, poliomyelitis. And under the respiratory borne disease, we have acute lower respiratory tract infections, measles, tuberculosis, and meningococcal disease. And under the vector borne diseases, we have malaria, dengue fever, and plague. And that of zoonotic disease, we have rabies and anthrax. So the above these are some of the commonly known communicabilities and the third question will be what is communicabilities control or CDC so CDC refers to the reduction of incidence and prevalence of edges to a level where it can't be a major problem while infection may still occur And the first question is, what are non-communicable diseases? So, based on that, 
non concave leases are leases that can't spread through infection or through another people but are typically caused by unhealthy behaviors. They are the leading cause of death worldwide and present a huge threat to health and development, particularly in low and middle income countries. Since, so, once we have defined the non communicable list, so can you list some of the examples of non communicable list? Yes. So, uh, based on that, cancer, diabetes, mellitus, heart disease, chronic lung disease, Alzheimer's disease, hypertension, asthma, and mental health ailments are some of the non communicable diseases worldwide. So, when you come to the definition of terms, so let us see one by one. So when we say transmission, it is the process by which an infectious agent or its product passes from the source to the new host. And period of communicability means the time during which the infectious agent may be transferred from infected person to another. And when we say incubation period, it is a time interval between initial contact with the infectious agent and the appearance of the first sign or symptoms of a disease. And when we say infection, it is the entry and development or multiplication of an infectious agent in the body of human or animals. And uh, when we say susceptible, a person or animal, presumably not possessing sufficient resistance against a particular pathogenic agent to prevent contracting infection or disease, if or when exposed to the agent. And that of carrier, carrier is an infected person or animal that doesn't have clinical signs or symptoms of a disease best service as a potential source of infection to others. Here we have also another important terms. When we say a case of a disease, it is a person or it may be a person or animal that manifests clinical evidences that is having signs and symptoms of a particular disease. In contrary, when we say suspected case, a person whose medical history and symptoms suggest that she or he may have been developing some communicable disease. And when we say notification, it is a process by which cases or outbreaks are brought to the knowledge of the health authorities. And when we say disease, it is a state of physiologic or psychologic dysfunction. And contamination, the presence of living infectious agents upon articles. And infestation, infestation, presence of a living infectious agent on the exterior surface of the body. And infectious agent is an agent capa capable of causing infection, isolation, the separation for a period of communicability of infected person or animal from another so as to prevent or limit further transmission of the infectious agent to those who are susceptible or who may spread the agent to others. So, zoonosis is also another important term used in CDC. So, when we say zoonosis is an infectious or an infection disease transmission under natural conditions from vertebrates animals to humans. 
and hosts means people or other animal that afford substance or treatment to infect agents under natural conditions and sporadic means these are diseases that are not normally present in a population but give rise occasional and irregular to epidemics so we can take the example of luck so when we say pandemic it is an epidemic or excessive occurrence of case over a wide area and usually affects a larger proportion of population so for example you can take hiv aids and one of the epidemics it is the occurrence of inhaled lethal condition and aggregate population in excess of the usual frequency in that population endemic a disease that is usually present in a population or in an area at more or less stable level so when we say exposure it is a contact between the agent and receptor host infectivity the ability of agent to invade and multiply in the host and pathogenicity is the ability of agent to produce clinically apparent disease or the property of an infectious agent that determines the extent to which over diagnosis is produced virulence is the ability of infectious agent to produce severe disease among clinically infected persons and when we say immunogenicity is the ability of an agent to produce specific immunity illness it is individualized subjective feeling of discomfort and when we say elimination it is reduction to zero of the incidence of a specific disease in a defined community or country or region are as a result of public health actions eradication it means worldwide disappearance of a disease for example permanent reduction to zero level Uh, when you come to the question number six what does chain of disease transmission mean so when we say a chain of disease transmission this refers to a logical sequence of factors or links of chains that are essential to the development of the infectious agent and propagation of the disease here we have six factors involved in the chain of disease transmission these are infectious agent reservoir portal of exit mode of transmission portal of entry and susceptible host so as you can see here, here we have the basic elements of chain of infection at which there are important factors to occur at this or for this occurrence so from the picture you can see that out of the chain of the basic elements of chain of this transmission we have physical environment we have the social environment and that of the economic environment so inside the circle we have six essential elements for a disease to occur these are we have the causes agent we have the reservoir portal of exit mode of transmission portal of entry and susceptible host so these all factors are 
interrelated and they, 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 they form some sort of chain which are responsible for this to occur. So when you come to the description of each elements of this chain of this transmission, the first one is amphicus agent. So when we say an amphicus agent is an organism that is capable of producing amphicus or amphicus disease. So on the basis of their size, amphicus agents or heterogeneous agents are generally classified into metazoa, protozoa, bacteria, fungus, and viruses. And the second important element of this chain of this transmission is reservoir. So reservoir can be defined as any person, animal, arthropod, plant, soil, or substance, or a combination of these in which an infectious agent normally lives and multiplies on which it depends primarily for survival and where it reproduces itself in such manner that it can be transmitted to a susceptible host. The source of infection will normally form the basis for the infective agent to infect humans. So this table shows some of the common reservoirs and source of infection. So under the disease we have list of these for example we have tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, malaria, rabies, measles, cholera, typhoid and tetanus. So for each of each disease we have reservoir and we have also sources. For example a disease called tuberculosis the reservoir is one and the source of infection will be sputum or from sputum and a disease called tetanus the main reservoir is soil and the source of infection will be else soil so you can see in detail the rest is reservoir and that's of their source of infection. So here we have three types of reservoirs. A reservoir can be a man, a reservoir can be animal, and a reservoir can be inanimate or non-living thing. So when a reservoir is a man, there are a number of important pathogens that are specifically adapted to man such as measles, smallpox, typhoid, meningeal meningitis, gonorrhea, syphilis. The cycle of transmission is from human to human. And the second type of reservoirs are animals. Some infective agents that affect man have their reservoirs in animals. So recently we have defined the term zoonosis is the transmission of this from animal to man under natural conditions. So here are some of the examples of uh, zoonotic diseases bovine tuberculosis from cow to man, brucellosis, cow, pigs and goats to man, anthrax, cattle, sheep, goats, horse to man, rabies, dog, foxes and other wild animals to man. So these are some of the zoonotic diseases. And uh, non-living things as reservoirs. Many of the agents are basically saprophytes living in soil and fully adapted to live freely in nature. Biologically, they are usually equipped 
two weeks stand market environment that changes in temperature and humidity so these are some of the examples of null limiting as reservoirs for example we have cluster dim botulism which is the etiologic agent of botulism cluster dim titani which is the etiologic agent for titanus cluster dim which is the etiologic agent for gas gangrene and the third important element of chain of this transmission is portal of exit so when we say portal of exit it is a site through which the agent escapes from the reservoir so these are some of the examples of portal of exit portal of exit may be JIT for example typhoid fever bacillary dysentery amoebic dysentery cholera ascaresis and it could be through respiratory tract for example tuberculosis common cold skin and mucous membranes for example syphilis and when we come to the fourth component of chain of the transmission or the mode of transmission so when we say mode of transmission it is the mechanism by which an infectious agent is transferred from one person to another or from a reservoir to a new host so mode of transmission can be direct or indirect or direct mode of transmission can be direct vertical or direct horizontal so when we say direct vertical mode of transmission consists of essentially immediate transfer of infectious agent from an infected host or reservoir to a proper portal of entry examples transplacenta transmission syphilis and hiv and in the contrary mode of transmission may be horizontal or direct horizontal mode of transmission this happens through direct touching biting kissing sexual intercourse droplet spread onto the conjunctiva or onto the mucous membrane of eye nose mouth drinking sneezing coughing spitting or talking usually limited to a distance of about 1 meter or less and mode of transmission also can be indirect mode of transmission which could be vehicle borne which could be vector borne or which could be air borne so when we say vehicle borne mode of transmission there will be indirect contact through contaminated and unmet objects or formats like bedding to use and personal soil clothes cooking or eating utensils surgical instruments or contaminated food or water it could be or uh, it may be a biological product like blood serum plasma iv fluids or in other substances serving as intermediate means by which an infectious agent is transported and introduced into a suitable host through a suitable portal of entry so when we say vector borne transmission occurs when the infectious agent is conveyed by an anthropod or object to a suitable host so a vector may be mechanical vector or it may be biological vector so when we say mechanical vector or mechanical transmission the arthropod or the insect transports the agent by soiling its feet or prophesis in which case multiplication of agent and the vector doesn't occur example common fly and uh, so vector may be we call it biological vector or biological transmission this refers to when the agent multiplies in the arthropod or insect before its transmitted such as the transmission of malaria by mosquito what you call biological transmission or biological vector and 
The third type of mode of indirect mode of transmission is airborne transmission. This is characterized by the dissemination of microbial agent by air to symptom portal of entry, usually the respiratory tracts. We have two types of particles are implicated in the kind of spread dust and droplet nuclei. So when you say dust, a small infectious particles of widely varying size that may arise from soil, clothes, bedding, or contaminated floors, and be this can be resuspended by air currents. When you say droplet nuclei, small residues resulting from evaporation of fluid droplets emitted by infected host or they will remain suspended in the air for longer periods of time. And when you come to the portal of entry, when you say portal of entry, this is the site in which the infected agent enters the susceptible host. For example, it could be through mucous membrane, it could be through skin, respiratory tract, GIT, or blood. So when you come to the susceptible host, a susceptible host is a person or animal lacking sufficient results to a particular pathogenic agent to prevent this if or when exposed. The occurrence of infection and its outcome are in part determined by host factors. The term immunity is to describe the ability of the host to resist infection. Resistance infection is determined by non-specific and specific factors. So, when we say non-specific factors, these are some of the examples. For example, we have skin and mucous membrane, well, mucus, tears, gastric secretion, reflexes, special responses such as coughing and sneezing reflexes. And we have also specific factors. Genetic hemoglobin resistance to plasmodium falciparum, naturally acquired or artificial induced immunity, acquired immunity may be active or passive immunity. So when we say active immunity, this type of immunity is acquired following actual infection or immunization. When we say passive immunity, this type of immunization occurs through administration of antibodies to the set of the post. Third learning objective is natural history of a disease. So what does natural history of a disease mean? A natural history of a disease refers to the progression of a disease process in an individual over time in the absence of intervention. Or, the natural history of a disease describes the course of a disease in an individual starting from the moment of exposure to the causal agent till one of the possible outcomes occurs. So here we have to understand basic principles under the natural history of a disease. One very important principle is that the mere presence of agent, host, and environment is not enough to cause the disease. So, as long as the agent, host, environment are in a state of equilibrium, this will not be initiated. The process of human disease would be initiated only if there is an appropriate intervention and loss in equilibrium between the agent, host, and environment. So, based on that, the natural history of a disease can be divided into two stages. One, pre-pathogenesis phase. Second, the pathogenesis phase. So, when we say pre-pathogenesis phase, or the stage of susceptibility, in this stage, the disease has not developed, but the ground has been laid by the presence of factors that favor its occurrence. For example, 
alcohol consumption for cirrhosis of liver. High cholesterol, obesity, type of personality, health disease, and smoking, hypertension, high cholesterol, stroke, radiation, smoking, immune suppression, and cancer. So under the pathogenesis phase, the pathogenesis phase can be divided into three. Stage of subclinical disease, the stage of clinical disease, and the stage of disability. So as the stage of subclinical disease or stage of symptomatic disease, at this stage, the infectious agent has entered the, body, the host's body and has begun multiplying. Even at this stage, there are no clinical manifestations of a disease, a term referring to a typical symptom and signs of that illness. Symptoms are the compliance the patient can tell you about, example, headache, vomiting, dizziness. Signs are the features that would only be detected by a trained healthcare worker, example, high fever, fast pulse rate, enlargement of organs in the abdomen. Uh, so the other thing is carers and its types. So a carer is an infected person or animal who doesn't have apparent clinical disease, but is a potential source of infection to others. So carers can be asymptomatic carers or healthy carers. These are persons whose infection remains an upper, for example, an a polyvirus, meningococcus, and hepatitis virus infections, there is a high carry rate. So the other type of carrier is incubatory or precocious carriers. These are individuals or persons who excrete or shed the pathogen during the incubation period. That is before the onset of symptoms or before the characteristic features of a disease are manifested. For example, measles, mumps, chickenpox, and hepatitis. So the other type of carer is convalescent carers. These are those who continue to harbor the infective agent or the causative agent after recovering from illness, for example, diphtheria, hepatitis B virus. And lastly, we have chronic carriers. These carriers state persist or still persist for a longer period of time, for example, type of fever, hepatitis B virus infection. So as you can see in the picture, the picture shows it shows the time course of a disease in relation to clinical expression and communicability. So here we have the communicability or communicable period and we have the clinical expression of a disease. So under here, we have a line. Below this line, there will not be a sign and symptom of this. This is termed as asymptomatic. Above this line, there will be appearance of sign and symptom of this, and this is termed as symptomatic. So based on that, we have incubator carriers. We have uh, Pre-patent period, we have incubation period, concurrent period, recovery period, clinical onset. We have cases of a disease. But still, we have a symptomatic carrier, chronic carriers, and relapse and recovery or disease. <clears throat> so, natural history of a disease, stage of clinical disease or infectious disease. At this stage, Sign and symptoms of disease are manifested. The severity of disease is variable depending on the interaction of certain factors. 
For example, nutritional status, omission of nutrients, and other things. For example, the person infected with plasmodium falciparum who has fever, vomiting, headache is in the stage of infectious disease in this case of malaria. And the time interval between the onset or the start of infection and the first appearance of clinical manifestation of a disease is called incubation period. For malaria caused by plasmodium falciparum, the incubation period ranges from 7 to 14 days. The clinical spectrum also depends upon infectivity, refers to the proportion of exposed persons who become infected. And pathogenicity refers to the proportion of infected persons who develop clinical disease, and virulence, proportion of persons with clinical disease who become severely ill or die. Infected hosts who have clinical manifestation of a disease are called active case. Individuals who are infected but who don't have clinical manifestations are called carriers. Still, carriers and active case can both transmit the infection to others. Common diseases can be classified as acute or chronic. So, once acute diseases are characterized by rapid onset and short duration of illness. For instance, diarrhea, diarrhea that starts suddenly and lasts less than 14 days is an acute diarrhea disease. Chronic diseases are characterized by prolonged duration of illness. For example, a chronic diarrhea disease lasts more than 14 days. C. Stage of visibility or stage of outcome. At this stage, the disease may result in recovery, disability, death, or the patient. Some diseases resolve completely, but some may leave residual effect of short term or long term duration, leaving a person disabled to lesser or greater extent. So, this picture shows this picture shows the natural history of a disease progression. So, starting from the stage of susceptibility to the stage of recovery or disability or death. So, as you can see, here we have the stage of susceptibility. There may be some sort of exposure. After exposure, there may be stage of subclinical disease. After this, there may be pathologic changes. And there may be stage of clinical disease, initial onset of symptoms, usually the time of diagnosis, and finally there may be stage of recovery, disability or death. So once we have seen the natural history of this, lastly we have to see the general principles of prevention and control of so uh, the general principles of prevention and control of common cavities will be discussed, uh, discussed later on, on part two of this show. Thank you. This is the end of today's session. Thanks for watching. A tube post.